All right. So yeah, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. You have uh, Dan Thomas uh, giving a talk on salt tectonics in orogenic settings, insights from the Romania Carpathians. Um, so yeah, Dan, uh, thanks again for joining us and for offering to present this talk. Um, I just want to remind everyone that you could uh, write questions on the chat or the Q&A um, session, and we're going to ask them at the end of the talk. So yeah, before, um, I'd like to introduce Dan. And so Dan is a researcher at the Babs Boliai University in Romania. I probably, I'm probably not pronounce, pronouncing it right, but <laughs> that's, fine. that's the best <laughs> I can do. Um, so Dan leads the analog and structural modeling laboratory there. Uh, he's, a he's, a passionate, he's passionate about teaching structural geology and finding new engaging ways to communicate uh, science with students. Um, he has uh, worked previously as a geologist at OMV Petron for more than four years and has focused mainly in areas uh, related to salt tectonics. He has a PhD degree in geology from the same university, Babes Bodia University, where he focused on investigating salt tectonics in the East, Eastern Carpath Carpathian band zone, sorry, by combining seismic data and also physical uh, analog modeling. Uh, so yeah, thanks again, Dan, and the floor is all, all yours. Bye. Yeah, thanks, Leo, for the introduction. I'll just share my screen. Is it okay? Yes, it's perfect. Yeah, we can yeah. see it. Yeah, I'll switch to the laser pointer as well. So yeah. Uh, so thanks for the intro. Thanks for having me. And hello, everyone. And today's talk will mainly focus on, on as Leo said, salt tectonics in, in, in orogenic settings, especially some insights from the Romanian Carpathians. And yeah, this work is, is not all my own. It's mainly done together with, with Joel Schleder from OMV, Chaba Krajek from Petrom, Alexander Tamas, who is now in Durham University, uh, Janos Uroy and Jessica Barabash, who are from Aachen University, Mark Rowan, and Sorin Filipescu from the Babesh Boy University. Um, before starting, I will really like to acknowledge all my former colleagues from OMV Petrom. So I really learned a lot while working with them. And I worked in, in hydrocarbon fields related to salt tectonics mainly at my time there. And what you see here in this image is a really, really nice way to show the amount of well data that was the amount of wells that were drilled there. So each small line you see is one well. So you see close to 4,500 wells in, in just this image alone. And what's even, even better that that you see is you see these areas which were avoided by wells. So this is uh, one of the well-known diapirs. This is the Moren diapir. And we'll talk about that a bit uh, in more detail later. And before we, we go on, I would like to say that this work is mainly, what you'll see today is mainly based on these four papers. So uh, before anything, I would like to, to also acknowledge uh, the reviewers and editors, especially during these strange times. And yeah, this is not an attempt to convince uh, the reviewers to be uh, really, really gentle with our, our submitted paper here. But yeah, with this occasion, I would also like to thank the people that answered to really stupid emails and especially Tim Dooley, who, who helped a lot when I was trying to learn more about analog modeling. So let's go on with the presentation. I'll try to keep it rather short, although I'm not sure I will, I will be able to. So we'll start by talking just a brief introduction of salt in fold and truss belts. And then we'll go a bit into the history of salt in the Romanian Carpathians. And then we'll take a short detour to, to look at some amazing uh, images of salt mines. And then we'll go into our area of interest, which is the Eastern Carpathian band zone. And there we have a lot of hydrocarbon fields related to salt tectonics. So you, each one of the blue dots you see here is a salt diapir, either close to surface or, or, at, or more at depth. And all the red dashed red lines you see are basically the outlines of hydrocarbon fields. So you see a lot of them are related to, to salt diapirs. 
And then we'll go a bit through, through some results from seismic interpretation, analog modeling and outcrop examples, not necessarily in this order, but somehow mixed. So when talking about salt in compressional settings, we all know it's, it's exceptionally weak compared to, to the um, other rocks that you find. So at shallow crustal depths and temperatures, the salt in folding truss belts is basically the most preferred uh, decoldment horizon. And what we'll see today mainly is either mostly truss die appears or erosional piercement, uh, but it's also sometimes a mix between passive active and trust or, or something like this. And it won't be some of it will be toe trusting and extensional, but that will be just some cases. And, but most of it will be in, in, in compressional settings and not in inversion, like in this case. We have a lot of insights in the Carpathians coming from, from outcrop data and from, from salt mines. And there's a really nice paper that, uh, that just shows the complexity also of the intrasalt deformation. And this is by Mark and, and Piotr and, and all, and it's just published. And, but there's also a lot of information that came from analog modeling. And you can see with analog models with multiple decolment horizons or analog models with, with um, pre-existing die appears that were later shortened. So there's a lot of information that we, we gather from there. But for those who are not familiar with the, with the Romanian Carpathians, uh, you can you can see them here. So this is Romania. These are the Carpathians. And for reference, you can see here Vienna, Krakow, and, and um, you have Budapest and Bucharest is right here. So here somewhere is the Black Sea. You see Italy, Greece. So that should kind of show you where we are. And basically, the Carpathian fold and trust belt is in Alpine origin, and it's the continuation of the Northern Alps. So it records the the closure of the Alpine Tethys. So that's from latest Jurassic to middle Miocene. Our main area of interest is the Eastern Carpathian band zone, which is a thick skinned, sorry, thin skin folding truss belt that was, was translated above the Milgen platform, which you can see here. The history of salt in the Romanian Carpathians goes so the history of salt tectonics and studies related to salt tectonics goes quite a back quite a long time back and basically it started with with the initial oil production in fact because the first the first registered registered oil production was in i think 1850s late 1850s and it was from fields related to to hydro to salt tectonics and here you see one of the, so there are many fields here, but this liniment holds, if I remember correctly, something had something like 4 billion barrels in place. And in, during the early 1900s, this is how the area looked like. And in this really nice uh, humanoid image of, of the Carpathian fold and truss belt that was uh, drawn by these two iconic figures in 1912, you see, uh, Popescu Wojtesht and Ludovic Mrazek. And you might know the Ludovic Mrazek, you might know the name from the fact that he was the one who introduced the term salt diapir. But uh, that's not the only thing that, that he did for the salt community and for the hydrocarbon community. So during his work, he had a lot of concepts far ahead of his time. So he was drawing uh, about the development of rim, rim synclines and mini basins without calling them that for sure. And he was also discussing viscous salt flow and he was comparing the, the deformation of the salt crystals during salt flow, something like the deformation of ice crystals during glacial flow. So those were many ideas that were, were not spoken about at that time, at least I don't think so. And he might be the first not only to, to draw salt wells, as you can see here, but also to, to explain how they form and why they form in some cases. So that, that was exceptional for, for that time. And yeah, we have a, a paper in 2018 showing more details if you're interested about uh, the historical part. And I kept talking about salt, 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 but I didn't say what age the salt in, in Romania is. So basically, traditionally, we have, we're, 
speaking about two main self levels, so the lower and the middle myosin self level. Although with the first one, with the lower myosin self level, there's quite a bit of uncertainty regarding its age. But during this presentation, as it's not the topic of the talk, we'll just say it's, it's myosin salt mainly. And here on the left, you see uh, on a restoration of the tectonic units at early myosin. So basically you see kind of the setting in which the salt was deposited. And we have a lot of salt in the Carpathian embayment being deposited and later being incorporated in the, in the fold and truss belt. But we also have salt in the Transylvanian basin and also in the Pannonian basin. And you see here in the Pannonian basin, there are just a few wells uh, that encountered salt recently, but I, I'm sure there's more and the, the, we'll have proper maps, I think soon from the colleagues from, from that side. But in our talk now, we'll focus on, on the Carpathian band zone and specifically we'll focus on two areas. So the Moren Baikoi area and the band zone looking at seismic data and analog modeling. And then we'll go to the Munzalesh salt outcrop and, and discuss a bit more there. But just before we go there, I, I invite you to have a nice walk through to some of these salt mines. So here you see Village in Poland and another salt mine in Ukraine, but I'll try to show you some really nice images from salt mines in Romania. Just a short introduction on, on the Transylvanian basin. So it's been interpreted to evolve uh, initially like, like a, in a passive margin setting. So you had an extensional uh, region here, then translation and folding, and then a compressional uh, region here. So you have these diapirs that evolved initially as passive diapirs and were later shortened. And you have the Turda diapir example which was uh, toe thrusting. So this is Turda and this, sh this should be Pride. So if we move to Turda, it's been recently made really famous by, by Red Bull because they, they did the f world first uh, underground dive in the salt mine. And if you look at the videos, you can see some amazing structures really beautifully imaged. So, but if you, if you go there and it's publicly available, what you generally see is, is a diaper that's been formed by the West Virgin Trusts. And what you see are predominantly subvertical foliations, uh, which strike kind of in a, in a, in a north-south orientation. And that's, that's consistent with, with the interpretation of the, how the diaper evolved. And uh, here you see, for example, uh, one of the large rooms and you see stalactites and uh, Professor Jan Oshroy being in a really unsafe place here beneath them all. And uh, you see amazing folds and the, the, the structure and the diaper is, is quite big. So the, the mine itself, I mean. If we move to the pride diaper, uh, this is the one that I told you evolved in a, in a passive manner and then was later shortened. What's nice about this diaper is also the, its historical importance for the community of salt because uh, it was one of the first recognitions of this cordon salt structures. And, and Poshevni at that time uh, was drawing uh, really sections that we nowadays see on seismic data and they had no such data. And what you see when going in the public area, you see really nice curtain folds and isoclinally folded salt. And this is the Ocne Lemar salt diapir. So this is uh, again uh, a truss diapir in the southern Carpathians. And this is uh, generally north to northeast dipping. What's nice is that you have uh, folding at, at different scales. So from tens of meters to meters to centimeters. And this is the topic of, of a recent study that we're working on mainly. It's, it's Marta with Jessica and Janos. And uh, so it's, it's an amazing place to be. You see, you see pillars, salt pillars. So then you can properly map in 3D the entire, the entire salt diaper. This is the, the Slanik Prahova salt mine. And what's really amazing about this mine is the galleries are, are built in such a way that you can properly map and properly see the same folds over and over again. And it's a, 
50 something meters meter tall uh, gallery so it's it's amazing the amount of structures you see and you see boudinage you see a uh, small scale trusting and mainly it's it's uh, dipping 45 degrees to the east side of the east and it's it's developed in in a syncline in a northeast southwest striking syncline and one of the the most uh, beautiful at least for from my side but although it's it's not as beautiful for tourists is the kachika salt mine which is here up in the north and this is this evolved as a east virgin trust that I appear but it's the most inclusion rich uh, and impure salt that i saw in any of the romanian salt mines and you have centimeter scale trusting uh, of the of the more competent layers, then you have isoclinal folds and boudinage and impurities up to decimeter size and meter size. And now let's let's finish our tour through the Romanian salt mines, and go to see in our main area of interest, which is the the Eastern Carpathian band zone, which is here. So. Basically, this is the most prolific uh, onshore hydrocarbon area in Romania. And as I showed you before, many of the fields we see here are related in some form to, to salt tectonics. Um, as a stratigraphic context, what we'll see mainly during this presentation is, is Cretaceous from Cretaceous to, to recent layers, but we'll mostly focus on, on the subsalt Oligocene and lower Miocene uh, deep marine deposits with, with fans and you know, submarine channels. And then we have our main salt layer, which is the one that it's, it's uh, interpreted as lower Miocene. And then we move to, to shallow marine to continental uh, deposits, and which are yeah, mid Miocene, late Miocene and younger. When we talk about uh, tectonic events, the main event is the mid Miocene compressional event. And then there's the, the later deformation, which is the Valachian event, which is, uh, um, you see it's one of the important components in, in, in the hydrocarbon fields. So talking about this, this uh, Valachian event, we now move here. So each of the folds you see at surface here are a result of this event. And many of the of the diapirs we see at surface now, I believe they're they're also a result of, of the same event. And what you see, and what we'll go on seeing is look at at the seismic line and this profile you see here, and then we'll look in more detail at the diapirs. And please keep in mind the um, the sigmoidal shape of of this bicoid diapir, because we'll we'll later discuss a bit about it. But before going into any of the interpretations, I'll first invite you to take a look at how the seismic looks in this area. So basically, this is the quality of the seismic data. And um, yeah, anyone can say, OK, we kind of already start and depict some, some trusts here. So basically, you can start interpreting. And you see here, and maybe you put a diaper here. So basically, you already say you 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 see something and it doesn't look that bad. But in fact, the issue is that our areas of interest are, interest are these. So here we're looking at the subsalt reservoirs uh, outcropping. Here we're looking in the subsalt and we cannot see that much. And here in the diaper area, we're not producing from, from this area, we're producing from this and this area. So basically in the areas where you don't see that much. So, it's hard to come with a, with a sound conclusion. It's hard to come with a, a sound story of how everything evolved. So what we did is we started doing uh, analog modeling experiments. And don't mind these thicknesses here, because we did a lot of parameter studies until we reached those thicknesses. But mainly, we have a lower detachment, which is the main lower detachment. For that, we used this shaley, and we used uh, glass microspheres. Then for the subsalt reservoirs, which are oligocene to lower Miocene, we used sand. And then for the salt, we used uh, silicone. And then for the super salt, uh, it was uh, again sand. And everything was pre-kinematic and it was put in a rig that was basically shortening 
uh, the whole sequence by pulling a mobile plate beneath uh, a fixed box and we were monitoring with cameras and and all sorts of uh, methods and at the end of each experiment we wetted the uh, we wetted the experiment and then we consolidated it and cut serial sections which were later uh, sliced and, and photographed so these sections are then interpreted in a 2D and 3D framework and their results uh, really aided, uh, gave us a lot of insights. Uh, so basically we, we found a lot of, about what was happening in the super salt and we saw those, those wide uh, salt core denticlines in the super salt, which we were, we were also seeing in seismic, but also uh, subsalt duplexes uh, which were consistent with, with what, what Jolt was interpreting and what Jolt was building in the structural models. And then this is kind of the, the final story we came up with, with uh, an area that was dominated by, by uh, so let's say, uh, quite open folds, uh, salt core denticlines and, and, and subsalt duplexes. And then the salt was almost as the top of the anticlines were being eroded, the salt was being exposed at surface in some areas, but uh, it wasn't in others. So that also uh, relates to some diapers evolving and some needing a bit of a, of a boost that we'll later talk about. But when take, talking about the, the complexity, it wasn't ending there. So the issue is that there's more variability in the subsalt in different regions. So what we did is we, we, we played around with also with the, re, the rheology of the subsalt detachment levels and the number of detachment levels. So then we saw anything from, from multiple duplexes to, the, uh, to uh, buckle folding to a lot of, of new structures that are not interpreted. And to make, the, to make everything even nicer, when, when you look at, at well data, and when you look at, uh, at all this well data and the dip meters, you see scattered dips, you see um, huge changes and quick changes in, in thicknesses of the reservoirs. And when you go on the field, uh, we can relate those to, to sand intrusions. So the Oligocene and Lower Miocene reservoirs are, are filled with sand intrusions. And these intrusions can go uh, as wide as, as 80 centimeters and as thick as two, four meters. And that gives a significant impact on reservoir connectivity. But that's kind of half of the story, isn't it? I just presented what happened in the, in the mid Miocene and how the detachment folds and then the erosion and that's it. So there's the other part of the story, which is the Valakian event. And everything here was called the post-tectonic cover. And we knew during the Romanian to Quaternary, so somewhere around more recent times, we had huge compression and, and significant movements. But what happened in that, in that time? So we started looking in more detail at, at the seismic data and at thicknesses and what we could see is that part of the mainly in the punction we could already see uh, areas which are syntectonic so you could see um, you could see uh, thickness variations along folds and and then if you if we properly map them and we went further to to build the thickness maps we could already see changes along the folds more significantly yeah, a note is that yeah, these are indeed uh, two-way time thickness maps, but we see we see the same on on the well data. The only question was what happens in the mid ocean because these thickness variations could be uh, as well related to paleo relief. And what you see here is a, a, a top structure map at at the base mid ocean unconformity. So so the level cutting all the 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 mid Miocene and so on. And we were thinking a lot about also about the diapir shape and what we can learn from it. So we knew we had a huge amount of well data and that was showing us salt tops, salt bases, 
but so when the wells go in and out of salt but can we do more to learn about the shape of the body not only with from shallow data so there we used uh, the neural network salt cube in feature in, in open detect basically what it does is a form of, of machine learning it's it's you build multiple attributes uh, attribute volumes like energy deep variance similarity chaos and we had, I think, about 50 different attribute sets. And you teach the software, it learns it effectively what is salt and what is non-salt. And then working for a week nonstop in, in, in the, this volume, it learned what is salt and what is not. So basically, we had an output of how the salt looked like, how the salt wall looked like. And then using also all the well data, we could construct a really detailed model of the salt. And this shape kind of maybe tells us something. What we usually see is during the punch and the, the diaper gets wider and then it gets narrow and then it gets wide again towards the top. So this could be also to the fact that during within the punch and you have some detachment levels that are used and it's shorting the diaper only here but it also could relate to, to the stages of, of salt uh, diaperism and, and the, the amount of salt and the amount of sediment coming in the basin. And as any, any uh, let's say, crazy geologists, we couldn't come up with, with one final story for everything. And for the Valakian event, we, we came up with, with two options, which are two scenarios which work for different diapers. Because in some diapers, we, we don't see any thickness changes, so not that much during the Miocian and maybe a, a little in the Pontian. And then we see normal faulting in, in, in the Dacian, which could, could relate to, to local pull-aparts opening due to strain partitioning, and then, and then that are later shortened. And those also you can depict in the sigmoidal shape of the of the diapirs, and other diapirs uh, might as well evolved as as passive diapirs, just uh, going growing, and the salt influx being controlled partly also by by the compression, so by the amount of compression that that was at that time. Now that this was kind of the first part of the talk. And now we move to see how one of these trust diapirs looks like in, in outcrop. And this might as well be the largest salt outcrop in, in Europe, as uh, it's kind of 2.7. This is the Munzalesh salt diaper. It's 2.7 by 1.3 kilometers. And it's, it's uh, positioned in front of the Tarko nap, um, between the Tarko nap and the Sukorpetian nap. You see it also here. And it's quite a deep rooted diaper. So well data suggests that uh, basically shows that uh, it's it's 3.5 kilometers deep, the, the base of the of the diaper. And if you look from from further away, uh, this is the main road, uh, you could really see the nice horizontal layering of the salt. And when you go close to try and maybe measure something or, or get samples, you find the fact that it's really steep and really unstable. So it's basically quite hard and unsafe to, to go up to, and it's basically almost impossible to get any proper measurements. Um, but here, uh, Janusz Roy and Joel Schleder, they, they ventured up and uh, looked at in close detail to the salt where it was exposed partially. But mainly, as you see here, it's it's covered by uh, quaternary layers with with um, uh, conglomerates, and then you have soil and and vegetation. I personally prefer to to keep keep going uh, just at the base of the salt type here. But if you if you look underground, and these are some photos from a really nice book on 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 cave systems in, in the Munzalesh salt diaper. If you go underground, there's a lot of cave systems. Most of them, or some of them at least, are, are collapsed sinkholes or collapsed areas. And you can see a lot of debris, and you can see a lot of, of large-scale boulders and large-scale. You see also the 
the high amount of impurities that you find within the salt mines, uh, the salt, I mean, sorry, the salt caves. And uh, a, pol a particular thing was that when, when this cave was uh, first explored, it was, I think, at that time, hold the record of the largest, the longest uh, cave in salt in the world. It was something like over three kilometers of passages. Now it's been it's been passed by other other cave systems. But I told you I like to stick to the outside. So basically, what you see when walking through the streams that cross the diapir, uh, as before going in in some areas, you see folded gypsum, and then mostly at 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 your level, you just see a mix of debris with sand and uh, salt and sediment, but it's not proper salt. There are just a few places where you can you can sample or see the salt exposed, as you can see here. And as as you walk uh, through the diapir, there are a lot of, of clusters. So from green schists to limestones to everything. So sandstones and with all ages from Cretaceous and everything even older. So these are our some of them probably come from the from the quaternary on top, but most of them come from the salt, as you also saw in the in the caves. So, in order to get proper measurements of the horizontal layering we were seeing, uh, we took the drone and then we flew over and around the, and in front of the of the outcrops themselves. And we acquired close to 4,000, I think over 4,000 aerial photos. And what you do usually, you take orthographic for photographs, you, you take them as orthogonal as, orthogonal as possible to the outcrop itself. And then it recognizes some points and it licks some points. And then you go to build the dense point cloud with which you can already work and extract some data, but you can go to, to mesh generation and then a textured mesh, which you can see here. And this is just the amount of photos illustrated here are just a fraction of, of what's actually been used to create this model. And if we look at the ortho mosaic and a digital elevation model, so what you see here is the satellite imagery and with a lighter shade here, you see the contour of what we did with the ortho mosaic. And if you zoom in, there are some levels with, with nice salt outcrops that don't show any layering and but there are some really interesting areas with sinkholes as you can see here which are up to 50 meters wide and 30 40 meters deep and uh, if you look at the outcrop as in how high it, it is the salt it's close to 200 meters with vegetation and quaternary uh, layers on top and uh, the red the red dashed line marks what we interpret as being the the shape of the of the salt diaper and what you see here in, in green are digital outcrop models of really good quality then yellow is lesser quality and then orange is quite poor quality where n basically not much data or no data could be extracted so now let's look at one of the digital outcrops, which is in the north. You see it's a really good quality outcrop, but uh, a lot of it, so more than 50% is covered by debris. But what you see here is really nice uh, layering, which is a really low angle layering. And then you also see sediments which are interbedded with the salt. So, and this is, looks like maybe a huge pudan. And it's really, uh, this is also low angle, as we saw from the, in the initial images. So it's uh, 20 deg 23 degrees to the, to the southwest. As we move to, the, to this outcrop, which is in the southwestern area, you see uh, in, in another one, you see also low angle. But here, close to the edge, we had the highest, uh, highest angles of the salt foliation, which is 53 degrees. And these seem to be cross-cut by some, some white salt lines, but we will discuss about them, them a, bit, a bit later. And here you can see some of the sinkholes. And here you see the, the overall picture of the 3D outcrop. And this is by far the, the best quality and the best exposure of the 3D outcrop. And here we, we could measure also the, uh, 172 measurements. 
and of the salt foliation and it's all close to horizontal so it's it's basically 23 degrees uh, 20 degrees uh, in average and what we could also see is a lot of, of iso isoclinal folds and tectonic lenses and we could see a lot about the fact that the, it wasn't the horizontal layering the initial layering of salt of a salt body it was in fact a deformed salt body and we also see this again these white layers this almost horizontal in fact white layers that are, are also cross crossing the foliation so we had four possible interpretations for this outcrop. So as I told you before, may, maybe an original uh, salt outcrop with uh, sub-horizontal layering and inclusion rich depositional salt. But when we saw the, the fact that it was uh, highly folded, then we, 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 did, we discarded that idea. And also they wrote it top of a long-lived passive diapirs. But as you know, in, in passive diapirs, you, you have a lot of upward flow. So the foliation should have been near vertical most of the times, not near horizontal. And also the, the last two options we have are a salt glacier that was in place by lateral flow at the surface or the sheer top of an incipient decapitated salt structure. And the answer came from, from Jessica and Janos. And now I'll talk about something that I, it's not my area of expertise, but I'll try to guide you through it. Hope I don't do huge mistakes. But what you see here are, are salt samples and, and section salt samples. And what you see here in darker colors are the known halite inclusions, which make up kind of 14% of, of these uh, exact uh, salt samples. And you see halite porphyroclasts mark here, which can go up to one centimeter. And these uh, samples also sometimes exhibit um, fibrous uh, strain shadows, which are, for example, you can see them here with these halide fibers. And they also have uh, halide grains, which are subgrain rich and halide grains, which are subgrain free. And based on, on subgrain size piezometry, uh, Jessica and Janos determined a uh, 3.5 megapascal differential stress and a 4 megapascal differential stress uh, based on recrystallized grain piezometry. So this high differential stress uh, basically told us that it's not a, a salt glacier. So by putting and combining all of our observations, so we have also the well data that show us, and we have really good control on the top and sometimes on the, on the base of the salt diapir. And we had some bits from the seismic image and all the outcrop and 3D outcrop data and the sections. This tells us that this diapir evolved from a salt core lentic line into a trusted diapir uh, at the boundary between the, the Tarco and the Superpatian nape. And we interpret those near horizontal white lines that, that I showed you to be shear zones within the salt body that occurred in, later in the compression. So now this is the, I hope you're still here. And uh, basically uh, all the recent seismic, 3D seismic coupled with well data and analog modeling give us, gave us huge insights into the complexity of the area. And the structural style is dominated by suprasol detachment folds and subsol duplexes. And understanding those salt shear zones, um, decapitated or partially decapitated side, side salt diapirs bring insights regarding the seal capacity and so on. Uh, overall, we got a better understanding of the remaining exploration potential in the area, and we, we still work a lot on this area. Well, thank you. Great, thank you so much. All right, if anyone has any questions, um, if you could please put them in the Q&A box and I'll start reading them. Okay, not in the Q&A. Otherwise, if not in the Q&A, please put them in the chat. Okay, so we have one. Okay. This one is from Kenneth Pearson. And he is asking you, 
In what way is the Pannonian Basin Miocene salt linked to the salt deposits in the larger Mediterranean area? So if I if I know correctly, the, the Mediter Mediterranean okay. salt we talk about is a lot younger than the, the mid Miocene salt that we have in the in the Pannonian basin and the Carpathian basin. So basically that, that was my middle Miocene. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Sanjay Sanjay says, excellent presentation. Great, thank you. Um, Zoltan Unger, he says, it's great. Thanks for the presentation. Mark Rowan says, Dan, great job. Do you think the majority or even all of the dye piers had origins as salt cord detachment folds? So yeah, good question. I think at least the ones in the Carpathians, most of them indeed they have. Uh, the ones in the Transylvanian basin, I, what I know is that some of them evolved initially as passive diapirs. And it, yeah, if you look at the Moraine and Baikoi, they initially evolved as, as detachment folds and then as passive diapirs. Great. David Thomas, he says, Dan, great talk. I learned a lot. On Andre, uh, oh, I don't know how to say the last name. Um, they say, very good job, Dan. Great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's hear. Okay, so now I'm going over to the Q&A. Please keep your questions coming. Mike Hudak, he is asking you, the term decapitated suggests that the top of the dye pier was removed and transported elsewhere. Is this what you think happened or was the thrust simply shearing along the dye pier flank and top? Hi Mike, thanks for the, for the question. Yeah, uh, so what is possible and what we saw in some of the analog models is that part of the salt that was carried along with the hanging wall was transported in front along with that thrust, but once you erode it down, you could miss it. But this we basically interpret as a diaper being sheared. So yeah, maybe decapitated is not the best, but it's it's in the process of being sheared away. I hope that answered your question. Sure. Um, we'll just see if he says anything else. And if he does, we'll come back to that. Um, Hey Min Koi says, hi, Dan, how do you distinguish recrystallized salt? Oh, this is a good one. I'd love yeah. to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> uh, I, so basically, yeah, that was Jessica's doing, but I can try to answer maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think part of the recrystallized salt was, was uh, the one with, with it was subgrain free. And also it had a 120 degree angle between the, the, the salt grains. And basically, yeah, but some of that yeah, is also could be initial salt. Cool. That's great. Um, Mike Hudak, he just says thank you and that you answered his question. Oh, um, we have one from Connor O'Sullivan over in Ireland. And he says, great talk, Dan. I really enjoy learning about Carpathian salt tectonics. How accurate did you find the salt detection plug in Open Tech? Open Detect, yeah. Open uh, Detect, yeah. <clears throat> uh, it was so you you also you saw the quality of the seismic. So it was it had huge errors in some part and it had good results in some part. And what was nice is that. We had really good control in some areas and poor control in others, but it it was good and bad. Let's say that, but we basically combined it with the well control. Okay. Oh gosh, I'm really sorry. I don't know how to say your name, so I will try. Um, this is Orsoila. I don't know how to say the last names. Um, they're asking you from which deformation mechanism, did you measure the differential stress? Um, 3.5 um, MPA, yeah, megapascals, as I remember. I mean, dif 
dislocation creep or solution pre precipitation creep or both? I think it was from both, but there I can I can ask maybe if if Janos or Jessica are here to give more details. Okay. If not, I can I can always uh, come back with an answer. Okay. Do you know who that person is? Uh, don't know the name necessarily. Okay. I'll copy and paste it. Okay. So thank you. Send it to you. Okay. Um, and then we have one from Deborah Duarte. Hi, Dan, great talk. How does the diapir passive phases relate to the regional compressional tectonics temporally? So depending which diapirs we're talking about, because I went through a lot of them, but if we're talking to about the ones in the band zone, so basically the, the what, I, what I was trying to say, if, if I understand the question correctly, is that the, the, the rise of the diaper was controlled by the Valachian event. It was controlled by the late Miocene to recent compression. So basically uh, compressing all that, all that salt made it rise uh, with a higher velocity or lower. Okay. I hope it's we have... what the question was about. Okay. Uh, we have one from Piotr. Is this diaper moving recently? Any GPS data on that? Piotr, uh, do you mean the dip here in the in the background, the outcrop, or most probably the yeah. outcrop? Yeah. So what we what we know for sure is that what you see behind me here, so those are quaternary layers, and those are two to three hundred meters up. So it's it's for sure they were deposited, and then it was moved. So it's it's quite also a recent movement. But nowadays we don't see any, any, I don't know of any data showing movement and we, no, we don't have any GPS data on that. Mm, cool. All right, we have another one here uh, from Alex Mafti. Do you use gravity data to validate your models? Yeah, and uh, Jolt when doing the, the structural modeling at, uh, I'll use the gravity models as well. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Okay, and then I had one for you. Um, with regard to the inclusions that you saw in, uh, I believe it was the last salt mine that you shared, yeah. are those inclusions only from the layered evaporite sequence or the salt sequence, or are they of different ages or do not know? So for that, we do not know, but I, what I would say is that they're from the layered evaporite sequence. So okay. even if not, it could be uh, conglomerates or everything, anything else shed in the basin at the time of the development of the origin. Yeah, Thank you. that sounds great. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I don't see any more. Um, if anybody else has any uh, comments or questions and you don't have Dan's email, please forward them to apgsaltbasins at gmail.com and we'll make sure that Dan gets your message so he can reply. Piotr just said applause. <laughs> Thanks, um, yeah, thank you so much. And um, just so you guys all know, next or in two weeks, we have another talk, um, our last talk of the season. And uh, we hope that you can all join us. So um, we now have our email situation sorted out. Uh, apologies if anyone hasn't been getting our emails. Uh, Gmail, they thought we were a spam account. So they're actually blocking some of our emails from going out. So we found a workaround. So hopefully um, we have that sorted out. And if you guys, uh, anyone in the audience, if they have any other questions or concerns, uh, please email the TIG. We greatly appreciate it. And thank you so much, Dan. Um, we really thanks. enjoyed having you. Yeah. Thanks. So I'll try to get the recording of this webinar out uh, probably next week, midweek about then and um, make sure and share it with your friends so everyone can sort of catch up on this part of the world. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Bye everyone, take care.